worship you for who God, that is why we gather here today to celebrate who you are, to hear a word from you, to open our heart to you. So God, we say those powerful words. Here I am. But more than that, God, here we are. Here we are as your children. Here we are as your church. Here we are as your kingdom, gathered to learn from you, kneeling at your feet. So lead us, teach us, and guide us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, everyone agreed and said, amen. You may be seated. If you all brought your Bibles this morning, would you open them to Hebrews chapter 11? Hebrews chapter 11. What we want to talk about this morning in terms of our teaching, we're going to talk about developing, I would like to call it, indigenous justice leaders for the 21st century. How do we, how do CCDA, how do the community development, the indigenous people don't do well in the world? It is, uh, it is the new people. It is the conquerors. It is the people who come in and take advantage of. They bring more technology, more resources, and they come in and they colonize and subjugate the indigenous people. And the poor in the world is basically indigenous people in land. I remember I was in uh, New Zealand when uh, they had the, uh, the, the uprising in, in, uh, in Fiji. It's when the colonel went in and uh, seized the parliament. And of course, uh, uh, Fiji was one of New Zealand's best trade partners, and we love New Zealand people. But when I found out what had happened and I knew what was going on, it was the first time that I'd ever been concerned and happy that a coup had took place. A coup had took place, and the colonel had went in and seized the government and power, and he said that I'm going to keep the power until we make certain that the indigenous people will not be colonized within their own land in society. Uh, they worked on it for a few months, got it settled down, and, uh, and he went in again when they didn't build within the Constitution what he wanted, and I was glad again, because indigenous people don't do well in the world. And so it's a matter, it's a matter really, it, that ought to be inherited in the Great Commission. Go into all the world and not colonize the nation and subjugate them, but go into all the world and bring them good news, good news that the Savior has come, good news that you can reach your potential in your own land and that you can develop your own resources, and that you can then export those resources and do equal trade with people in other nations in our society. We haven't done that. The mighty and the strong and the powerful have ruled, just like we have allowed our economic system in America right out in the open to exploit and subjugate and pull the whole nation down with a few billionaires who are taking it over in our society. So, and the church was silent in all of this. We are supposed to be people of vision. We are supposed to be God's prophetic people in the world. We are salt and light in the world. We are supposed to be able to, because we are speaking for God, he gives us intelligence and he gives us vision for the future. And vision is how we live, how we live. And so, uh, we want to look at that. This is a crucial time because in a way we look at it, there is a ter big paradigm shift in our society. It'll be a continuation of the kind of exploitation we've had in our own nation, the richest nation on earth that can't provide health care for its people in our society and many other issues. And the church need to come back with a, a prophetic voice that we not, not, not we as a church people, while we are radicals, we are radical for justice, we are radical for righteousness, and the Christians ought to be willing to lay down our life for their belief because the biblical idea that our life is hid with God in Christ, that we have been crucified with Christ, and so we are living out a new resurrected life. We are living out a life that can't die eternally. 
And, and so we, we are absent from the body. And so we are not supposed to be the violent people in the world. People commit violence on us in the world. We go out and we be martyrs for Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus called us to. He called us, come and be my martyrs. Come and be like me. Come and follow me and follow me in society. But we're supposed to be able to speak. We're supposed to be able to share the word of God and, and not be bought off by the political system, by either the conservative Republican or the liberal Democrat. We're supposed to be able to speak a word of good news to them, good news to all of those people in society. And so what we've got to come back and talk about justice leaders, justice leaders for the 21st century. And that we need to then go to the Word of God and look at the Word of God. That's what CC Day is committed to. We are committed to trying to help our people alter our steps by the Word of God. We believe that the Scripture was inspired by God and they are good for our edification, for our learning, so that we might be the people of God to do the work of God here on earth. The church is the incarnated body of Christ in a neighborhood, in a community. And we are to be that. We are not supposed to be just absolutely a commuter church. Not absolutely. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm not using this thing to condemn anybody this morning. Because I got something to say, you, you, you know, and, and, and this morning. And so open your Bibles to, to Hebrews chapter chapter 11, and we're going to talk then about um, justice leaders. How can we develop justice leaders for the 21st century? And what we're going to do, we won't read this. We'll read it as we go. We'll read it down here. We're beginning at verse uh, uh, 23. And what we're going to do here is that we're going to look at the original justice leader. And then we're going to look at what was the ingredients that went into the society that developed Moses as this great leader. And then we want to then look at that and try to take that teaching and then apply that teaching back to our neighborhood and see can we raise up indigenous justice leaders for the 21st century. You know, uh, I was thinking about it. There's a, there's a, uh, a church in Chicago. It's part community church. We have moved back in, and God is blessing that church right in the heart of Caprina Green. And they have made a commitment there, the political system, to, to keep a great section of Caprina Green. Caprina Green sort of represented the urban poverty and crime 15 and 20 years ago. And this new church is coming in there and, de and developing. And one of the things I'm encouraging them to do is to work with those 5,000 indigenous people. And, of course, they have developed on a school down there and all of that. And so the idea would be that should be their emphasis. That's what they're there to do. Naturally, because the city is gentrifying, you, you know, and there's going to be a lot of new people coming in, they're going to be there to reach them, direct them, encourage them, and to disciple them to raise up these indigenous leaders from this neighborhood. Well, that's what we got to look at. We got to look at the new urbanization. It'll be another replacement. It'll be another coming in and tramping over the indigenous people in, in that neighborhood. And so we got to raise up from those neighborhoods and then enfranchise those people. In that case, it's very difficult because they are living in government housing, you understand? And so the idea will be then, how do we enfranchise these people in these high-end institutions in the urban community? And how do we raise up those leaders? That's a task that we got to work on. Otherwise, this will be a new replacement. Uh, it used to be good that it, it, uh, uh, poor people were in the inner city because they were near the operation of the city. But now more and more, even in Chicago, where the poverty is now is out on the edges on the edges in the, in the community. And so it brings it more expensive to the, to the indigenous people of the, of the city. And so let's look then at our, at our teaching this morning from Hebrews uh, uh, chapter 11, beginning at verse 23, we, through 28, what we have there is that 29, we have the, the life of Moses 
in about seven verses, we have the history of Moses' life. And so what we want to do here this morning is look at those important uh, virtues that produce Moses, and then we're going to go back to our community, and then we're going to begin to implement this, and we're going to develop a sort of a, a justice leader's curriculum this morning. You, you know, what, in, in order to develop justice leaders, there is some things that go into that curriculum so that these justice leaders can, can emerge. Let me just say a word then about uh, Moses being the original justice leader. Uh, Moses in the Bible is the model of what prophets and shepherd leaders was to look like. Uh, God selected Moses, raised Moses up specially uh, to, for him to have a task, and that task was to bring about the God's revelation of his love for people and his redemptive purpose uh, in terms of bringing the nation of Israel out of Egypt and developing a whole thing, idea of deliverance and salvation and all of that. But you know, as Moses went on that task, because God has always wanted to live in us, God has always wanted to be precious to us. But because of Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden, it's become difficult for God to have this intimate relationship with sinful humanity. Uh, you know, you know if, we, if we look at the scripture closely, we're going to see that, and we'll get to that, justice was the motivation for God's redemptive plan. Uh, Paul says that in Romans. How can God be just and justify us after we have sinned? So what happened when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, God had a major problem. And the idea then, how could he have this intimate relationship with humanity and they living in sin? So he had to work out a redemptive plan. And that redemptive plan was someday that he himself would incarnate himself here on earth. He would be the, he would be the, uh, the, the, the person, uh, the seed of the woman, would be the person that would someday bruise the serpent head. And so how could he get rid of sin? That was the idea. And that was the Old Testament story then is about how, and then of course it came to pass. And of course Moses symbolized that when he said in the wilderness, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And as that serpent became the cure for sin and those snake bites and all of that, Jesus Christ would be the cure for our, for our sin. And so Jesus did come, and he was incarnated God here on earth. Okay. And, and so the idea then was, how could God be just and justify you and me? So uh, a religion that don't have justice at the center is not a religion at all, because God created all humanity in his image. And he created all the resources of the earth in order to enhance that life that he placed in man. We'll get to that in a few minutes. And, and so justice is at the very heart of God's concern for the, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the humanity. And so let me go back to my thoughts here as Moses being. So God has always wanted to speak to people, but because, because of sin, he had to get a mediator between him and humanity. And in this story here, Moses becomes the great mediator. And so as God wanted to talk to the children of Israel out in the wilderness from the mountain, the people eventually said, God's voice is too terrible. We can't listen to it. And so we do not want to hear the voice anymore. And Moses really wanted God to speak to him. He did not want to be that spokesman. He wanted God to be that spokesman. And then they, got, they said, we don't want to hear God anymore. It's too terrible. It shakes the mountain. Uh, when God speaks, it's too terrible. He said, Moses, we want you to speak to us. And of course, Moses, knowing God's will, became very, very sad. He prayed all night because to him, it was re the people had rejected God, but they were also rejecting him as God's messenger. And then God said to Moses, uh, uh, okay, Moses, they're not really rejecting you. They're rejecting me. But you're going to be the spokesman. And from now on, I'm going to raise up leaders like unto you, Moses, who are going to speak for the people. 
So God is a shepherd leadership God. God is a shepherd leadership God. You got to keep that in mind in society. So let me give a definition then of leadership first as we go into it. Since we're talking about developing, that's our theme. Our theme is developing justice leaders for the 21st century. Then what is a leader? Let me give you a couple of definitions. Uh, what is a shepherd leader? What is a servant's leader in society? Um, a leader, I think I like Bill Hybels' definition of leadership in his book, uh, Courageous Leaders. He said a leader is a person who's able to turn vision into passion. Turn vision into passion. It is passion. It is passion. Passion is a compelling force that drives you to the poor and the hurting. It is passion that calls people to be able to communicate and to help people. When Jesus, you could see when Jesus was here on earth, it always, when he would see a situation that was very desperate, you know, and people in pain, and they would say he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them. So passion is that driving force in life. And so a leader is a person then who can take a vision from God uh, that's what they call an Old Testament leader. They call him a visionary. He was a person who had met God and had a vision from God. And how do you turn that vision into passion? There's a working definition for, for, for uh, uh, a leader that I like, and I like that one from President Eisenhower's idea of a leader. He said uh, a leader is a person who gets other people to do exactly what the leader won't done, and they do it because they want to. See, that's the sort of a shepherding, nurturing. A leader should be known not by his own self-exaggeration, but a leader should be known by the people that they enhance. It is the people that the leader leads is the most important element. It's not the leader himself. We have reversed that. We have given all the goodies to the leader instead of the leader focusing the resources on the lead because it's the lead that's going to carry out the tasks that need to happen in society. And so that's a working definition uh, of a leader. Well, then I better talk a little bit about justice first, then, shouldn't I? Since we're talking about leaders that can lead us to justice, you know, we're talking about leaders then that can, uh, that can uh, be the justice leader, the leaders who can raise up indigenous justice leaders in the neighborhood in which God sends them and cause them to go in the society, then we need to have a good definition of justice. And so what is justice? Justice primarily is a stewardship issue. If mankind was created in the image of God and have inherited dignity, and if God said about humanity the best things in the world, and if he created this world for mankind to manage and to utilize it and to subdue it and to use God's resources, he intended for those resources to be managed in a way that all life could flourish. Jesus was thinking of that when he said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So the earth was created for humanity to manage so that life could have its best chance here on earth. And so it depends then on how we explore it. And he told Adam to subdue it, exploit it, develop it. But the idea is to use these resources for employment and work. Now that's important. That's important. God never intended for us to develop a welfare system where people sit around and do nothing. God never intended that. That's not a part of God's Old Testament plan. It's not a part of his New Testament plan. Work is therapeutical. Work is good for us. Work is being good stewards. The Bible says, Jesus said, he God worked and held it to and we work. And so the work is what God wants us to do. And so we have developed a, a, a system that exploits, don't recognize people's dignity and creativity, and, and then we then call it welfare. We fought the victim. 
fought the victim. The poor people did not have the intelligence to create the kind of old-fashioned welfare system that we created to dehumanize themselves. If you'd have left it to poor people, they would have never done that to themselves. But it took very creative people to create that kind of a system uh, in, 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 in society. Okay, so we, 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 we're not talking here about welfare. We, we are talking about, we are talking about uh, uh, managing and stewarding the essential resources of God and making certain that none is left out, the widows and orphans. But they will not to give that resources to Ruth and, and Naomi. She had to go to the field and work. And so the poor and the widows had to always work. And you watch the prophets. Whenever they would even perform miracles to take care of the widows and offerings, the people who was the widows and offerings, they had to make the first move. They had to do something. She had to go out and pick up the sticks and cook the oil and cook the bread. She had to do something. And so work is inherited. And so how do we manage God's resources? So then we are saying then that justice is a stewardship issue. Justice is how we manage and control and distribute God's resources, and that we want people themselves to be involved in that process in, 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 in life. And we are involved by our own effort, by our own work, by developing our own intelligence so that we can participate in, in that. So we understand um, uh, justice. Tomorrow morning, we're going to have a, a judge, I think it's tomorrow morning, uh, who's going to speak to us for a few minutes, and that she's going to talk to us about our present so-called criminal justice system. And of course, this kind of system we have in terms of, a, of, a, of incarceration and prison, God never wanted in his society. Uh, uh, jails represent, prison represents our failure. And when, when, when Jesus sends us out with the good news, he sends us out, he reminds us to go and open the prison. And in the last, when he judges us in eternity, he's going to ask us, did we go to the prison? Did we go to the prison? So prison is a sign of our own failure, and prison is a sign of our own exploitation of our people. And the most exploited people in America is young black males. And I could go into a long way to tell you how that happened. I don't have time to tell you how it happened. Because when you go into the prison, you're going to see it there, and we're going to find out and discover that 97% of those young black males grew up without any nurture, particularly grew up without any nurture by a father in, in a home, in a community. So we know some of the problems in our society, and those are the tasks that lie before us, and if we're going to raise up justice leaders, those are some of the issues that we got to deal with in our society. And, and so then we understands the key points here. Um, so we got what is a leader, we got what is justice. Now, the, here's the four elements that a justice leader must have. You need to write these down. The first one is vision. Without a vision, the people perish. I'm not going to go long on that. You got to have vision. We said leadership is the ability to turn vision into passion. So without a vision, the people perish. And so the leader must have a vision. And a leader should lead out of vision. And a leader should lead out of passion. A leader should lead out of his concern for the lead. I've already said that in society. Okay, and so number one, then a leader must have vision. Number two, a leader must understand the importance of energy, energy, energy. And most particularly the importance of human energy. And how do we manage human in energy? Because a leader must have followers. I know I'm, in, I'm CCDA's forward person out there. And I meet everybody, and we have a thousand organizations in CCDA, and we are so thankful for every last one of them in CCDA. But I'm always meeting people who fix and start an organization. And they come around and ask me, Brother Perkin, I'm starting my 501c3 or whatever. And tell me how to get it going. If God has called me to do this. And I said, um, how many people do you have help me? It ain't nobody but me. Oh, you ain't ready. <laughs> the 
to be a leader, you got to have some followers. That's the first step. A 501c don't make no organization. What makes an organization is people coming together, pooling their energy, pooling their resources to carry out the task that is before us. And so I, I get that all the time. Okay. And so energy, you got to know how to manage You got to have somebody. Most of these people who are talking about an organization, uh, they are on a lonely walk. If you are, call yourself leading and nobody's following you, you're a lonely walk by yourself. So a leader assumes that there is somebody. And I said, can you get me three people? Because it takes three people to organize a nonprofit organization. And they I don't have nobody but my wife. And, and I have my cousin, but he ain't saved. You, <laughs> and, and I'm thinking to start a Christian organization <laughs> in, in, in the world. And so people hit me with that kind of foolishness all the time. I said, you need to go and join the church somewhere. <laughs> go and join your church and start your Sunday school class. You'll have some people following you and listening to you. You know, okay, number one, number one. <laughs> Uh, number two. Number three is, is that leaders must understand how to manage intelligence. That's the thing that what, what uh, Gordy and I, Gordy didn't say that because he didn't want to put me down. He wanted me to look good last night. He was a do-nothing president. I was a do-nothing chairman. And, and so we didn't get this organization moving until we got somebody like Noel to come along and, and, uh, and make it go. Organize the people. Organize the staff. And you can see the difference, can't you? You can see the difference when we are able to get some people together to make an organization go. And so we are bringing that intelligence together and managing that intelligence. That's an important thing for our leaders. The reason our leader organizations fail, because the person with the vision thinks that they have the most intelligence. It's a difference between vision and intelligence. And the people themselves around you have the intelligence. And so you need to bring those people together and learn how to train and manage them so they can carry out the task. What we said was, we said a leader is a person who gets other people to do exactly what the leader wants done, and they do it because they want to. And so the leader is encouraging and managing and bringing the intelligent people around him or her so that they can carry out the task. And so the leader stay there and manage the vision. The, men, the leader stand before God and listen to God to make sure that the, this is a vision from God. And then that person then lead the people. And so intelligence. Number four, which is so important, and this is the purpose of discipleship. The purpose of discipleship is to shape our character. To shape our character and to shape our moral stability in life. And, and so if you're a leader, if you're a leader then, it's important that your character is shaped. And so what we got to bring back to the church and back to our discipleship is a sense of moral accountability. I think the old people would call it holiness. People who are trying to live right. People who are trying to be right before God. People who are, who are trying to live out Jesus' righteousness because that's what he closes us with. He clothes us when he saves us. He clothes us with his righteousness. And then we're supposed to live out that righteousness here on earth. And, and so leaders that are doing everything and, and getting in all kind of trouble is not really leaders. And we now allow our leaders to be ragly. Ragly, not leaders with integrity. Leaders are upright. Leaders that follow the, the admonition of Paul, of Timothy, and, and Titus. What leaders should look like in, in the world. And so now we understand the leader. We better go quickly now into, um, into the teaching. That's a background here of the leader. Y'all got that? But you got to have a good background. You, you got to know about a leader. You got to know about justice is our mission. Justice is our mission. Vision comes from God. Energy is organizing our people. Intelligent is bringing the right people with the right understanding around the project so we can solve the problem. And then we must have moral intelligence in, 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 as we're going to lead. Now, so we're ready now to look at Moses. Moses possessed all of these characters, all of these characteristics. And so let's go to our text and look at Moses. And what I'm going to do here is pick out quickly the seven ingredients, I will call them, 
that went into Moses' life that made him that great leader. And my goal now is that you will take these seven, go back to your community, and meditate upon those, teach those, use this as a curriculum to raise up these leaders like Moses. <laughs> That's what it says here in verse 23. By faith, when Moses was born, was hid three months by his parents. What is the first thing that comes out with us here in Moses? His family. 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 The crisis in our world today is the crisis of the family structure. Family structure. That poses a crisis in our community, in my community, because 84% of my children in my community is being raised without a father in the home. That's an absolute crisis. And I've already told you how that looks when it gets to the prison. It looks like 97%. And so that's a major, major, major crisis. And how do we now work on developing, you might say, extended families? How do the church become the family of God in the neighborhood? And then how do we then build around those mothers in that community that is trying to raise their children without a father? We have developed something we call Zechariah 8 where we take these mothers with two or more children who don't have a husband, and we bring them into our program, bring them into our housing, and we sort of nurture those children. And we have some young, be young boys, and I'm looking at a, a couple of twins now. Uh, they would have taken their mother down and done beat her up because it's difficult for women today because they have so much hope for these boys and, these boys, and that they really have developed almost the way they hope for them and nurture them in society, they moves, moves from them the kind of stamina that is needed to be a man and a boy in the world. And so there need to be some men coming along beside of those boys. And my son, uh, Wayne here, have almost like adopted those two boys as his boys. And on a Saturday morning and the other days, he got them in there and he teaching them how to work. And they just love it because he ride around in the pickup and do these kind of things. And he let them drive the go-kart and stuff like that. And so he done build a more credibility in their life as a man so he can hold those kids accountable so they can grow. Well, all of us men have got to do that. And the other thing that we got to do is that we got to encourage our boys to go to college and get a, a teacher's certificate to teach elementary school. Because these students don't see a boy until they're in the eighth grade. They don't see a man teacher. And so we need some men in those elementary schools teaching our children. So we should be encouraging our young men to go to school, get teachers' credentials. They can be a principal anytime, anytime. Within five years, they're going to want to make them a principal. Because they, for number one, they're going to know how to teach. You teach. And, and, and number two is that most of all the elementary school teachers, principals, are women. And they need some men in there to model out for those young people what it, what, it, what it means to be a man. And so, number one, family. We can go into that. Family. Make that the most. That's what the church is supposed to be. The church is the family of God. The family of God. And so we got to live that out and activate that the best way we can back in the community. Number two, what it says about Moses. It says that Moses are... People by faith. Faith is number two. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Where does faith come from? That's important that you know that, and I'm going to have to hurry. Faith comes from the Word of God. Faith is just... Where faith is born is when we believe God, and we believe His Word, and act upon it. What makes Abraham the father of our faith, he heard the voice of God, and he obeyed it, and he believed it. He obeyed it, he believed it, and he becomes the father of our faith. And so the Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's why we got to bring the word of God back into our community. More and more when I'm teaching today, I realize when I'm teaching that what I am teaching and what I am saying is not powerful enough for the problem in our society. So when I'm teaching, I'm praying and hoping that the Holy Spirit would take these words and penetrate people's heart 
because that's the first work of the Holy Spirit. The first work of the Holy Spirit is to lead us and to guide us into truth and to make Jesus Christ real in our life. And so we got to teach it. It's, it's not our charisma. It's not all of that that's important. It's God's charisma. It is his Holy Spirit that takes his word. But we got to proclaim it. We got to can't proclaim it. It can't just be folklore. It can't be what somebody else said about God. It's got to be God's word that we got to teach. And so we got to go back to the Bible and begin to teach the word of God. And so faith is born. Number two, that's number two. So Moses came from a family of faith. They believed God. And because they believed God, you're going to see they're protecting God. Their, their faith, they're protecting Moses. Their faith led to action. Their faith led to action. Number three, it says they saw he was a beautiful child. This word beautiful here means they saw that God had some noble purpose for Moses. Write down purpose. Purpose. It is purpose that guides our life. In my neighborhood, in my community, when I teach the kids, the first thing I do with them is that I help them to come up with some purpose for their life. And I don't care if they want to be a fireman or a policeman or a football player. I said, hold on to it. Keep the purpose. Keep purpose. It is purpose that restrains our instant gratification. It is purpose, purpose. What made Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach so powerful for 70 years in Babylon, it said they purpose in their heart. And so they was driven by purpose. If you don't have a purpose of your own, other folks are going to use you in life. And you'll be carrying out that purpose instead of your own purpose in life. I say to the little girls all the time, I say, what do y'all want to be? And most of them want to be nurses. I said, well, if you're going to be a nurse, you can't have a baby when you're 13. That baby is going to interfere with your purpose. And so what you got to do then is restrain yourself, you, you understand, and so that you can get the education you need and learn what you need to learn. And so it is purpose restrains us. Purpose gives us direction. Purpose calls us to some kind of commitment to what it is that we want to do with our life. And so Moses had a purpose. His family recognized that God had given them Moses for some noble purpose in life. And so they wasn't afraid of the king. Number, number four. What do we got? One, two, three, four. Number four. Um, it says... Uh, here, because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they was not a, afraid of the king's commandment. Uh, Moses came from a family of courage. Courage, that's important. That's what makes athletics such a wonderful discipline for people. Because athletics teach you how to win and it teach you how to lose. A athletic uh, exposes you. And so we have to help young folks. And young folks, the, the people who commit most of the crime are not on the athletic team. Oh, yeah, they smoke dope and do other things. You know, they take home all this other stuff. But they, they are not the people who commit the great crime because uh, they have developed courage and competition in, in, in life. And what is courage? What is the ingredient of courage? Well, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage the ability to do one's conviction in the face of fear. And so we have to help young folks. That's why the soccer moms thing, it works. It works. There are some things we know that work. And we can explain. That's why boy scouts work. That's why girl scouts work. That's why clubs work. Because it helped people develop that sort of inward courage and discipline. It teach you how to win. It teach you how to lose. In, in society. And so courage is very, very important that we expose the kids. Take them camping. Take them camping. I remember in California, we used to take these kids out of these rough camp, and these gang guys, we made them leave their guns at home and all of that, and took them out there. And when we got them out there in those woods, they were scared as they could be. <laughs> they would hear them, 
they would, they would hear those voices and those people, those, all those different voices they'd never heard before out there, and they would be nervous. And that, that's why they're, they're carrying those guns, because they haven't learned how to manage fear. I know I was in the military. And when you get finished with your basic training in military, and, you, and I was a sort of an athlete even then, but when you get through with your basic training then, you don't really hardly need no gun for, for no human because you feel adequate. You feel adequate. You feel equal to the next person. And so you don't need to have to kill him. And you don't need to have to wear no gun because of fear in, in, in life. And so we got to develop people, develop themselves, help them to know that they are somebody important and significant in life. And then they can love their neighbor they love themselves. They can respect their neighbor, they respect themselves. And so we got to teach young people that don't these kids gonna have these guns and these things ready to kill people in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a society. So courage, we got to teach. Um, uh, number five, is it number five or number six? About number five. It says this, by faith when Moses was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses had a healthy sense of his own identity. That's important. If you had asked me, and I went through the civil rights movement in Mississippi, if you would ask me what was the most damaging part of our long enslavement in the South, I would say that we lost our identity, we lost our personhood. And it wasn't until Stokely Carmichael and Malcolm X stood up and said, black is beautiful. The civil rights movement was on. People have to reclaim their humanity. They must claim the fact they was created in the image of God. And they have inherited dignity. Give people name, give them derogatory name, give them some kind of name, call them a nigger, call them a gook, call them a honky, call them something. That means that you are putting that person down. You don't believe in their humanity, their humanity. Because human beings are created in the image of God and they have inherited dignity. And when people claim that dignity, it's, 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 it's something, it's powerful. It's powerful. We are seeing that in Iraq. It's very difficult for us. It was almost impossible for us to colonize Iraq. It's almost impossible to colonize people who have a sense of their own inherited dignity in society. You must believe that lie that you are inferior in order for people to colonize you and exploit you in the world. And so we got to recognize that, and that's the first truth we got to teach kids, that they are created in the image of God and they have inherited dignity. They are not better than nobody else, but they are not worse than anybody else, and they're just as good as anybody else. That's the first most basic truth that the human being need to understand, and we need to nurture them in that. And when it comes to the racial thing, I like children theology. I don't like our theology. I like children's theology. This is the way they think about the races. God loves the little children. All the children of the world, brown and yellow, black and white, they all are precious in his sight. God loves all the children of the world. In Christ, our racial identity is lost. We are putting too much emphasis. Once we have known it, once we have known it, when we, are, we need to know that we are black, white, whatever race, up until this place, this moment, that we are born again. And when we are born again, we become a new creature. Old things are passed away. Paul said, I once thought of things as a Jew. I think of them no more. I even we thought of Jesus as a Jew. We don't think of him no more. And that's when he said then, if any person be in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. This racial thing is nothing but wasting our resources. Yeah. Wasting our resources. We need to overcome that. All of us need to overcome that. We got to overcome it if we're going to be the church, if we're going to be God's people here in society. And so we need that health, the sense of identity, and right now our identity that we are the people of God. We are the people of God. God expects us to do his work. And God expects his church to reflect 
the kingdom of God that he shows us in heaven. And when we look in heaven, we see all the nations praising God together. This is the beautiful thing. And last night, I could have been in tears last night as I went to that new uh, members, new people rally. I saw the makeup of that rally, these young folks. And I see how that these young whites, black, Indian, and others, and Hispanic, are joining together as a team. And as I went in there and looked at all those newcomers, those young people, and I went around to the tables, they was there, and knew that there was a, a mixture of race. That's what we want it to look like. We want the kingdom of God to look like CCDA. Yeah. And that we, inside of CCDA, in the board, we are working with that issue. We are working with that issue, and we are working with it deeply. We're trying to learn how to speak to each other in love. We're trying to learn how to encourage each other. We're trying to learn how not to be putting each other down and judging each other on the basis of our race and nationality in society. That's the thing that I'm so delighted, uh, Noel, that, that was just, I was moved again yesterday morning when I went in to see the Hispanic people, how he's bringing them together and the message they are getting, the message they are getting. And they are not just going back to develop just little old Hispanic hulls. They got to go back to those communities and reach out beyond those races. The Chinese are beginning to do that. Other groups are beginning to reach out beyond their own race and nationality to reach out to those. Oh, yes, yeah, start with the people you have. Start with your own people in the neighborhood, but then recognize they are responsible for the reaching out in that neighborhood to the people who are there, regardless of their racial background. And so identity, uh -huh. identity. Number six, I guess, eh? Number six. We got to understand uh, suffering as a virtue. Suffering is God's means of discipline. I like what uh, Pastor Bernard was talking about last night. There is a prosperity theology, but it's not this you're hearing on television. It's not this you're hearing on television. There's a prosperity theology that has to do with engaging people to do creative work and to think and to invest and to give and to share their resources with each other and to share that resource with people, and to share that resource with the, with the people in the kingdom of God, to build a church in the neighborhood. There is a prosperity theology, but it's not this that is making these people rich, and it's not this that's buying airplanes for pastors to fly around in, and buying all this kind of stuff. That's exploitation. That's another form of exploitation. And so, but there is a prosperity. And that prosperity is based to, on our own creativity, our own hard work, our own saving, and our own closing up of these financial ripoffs in the community, these payday loans. That is terrible on the poor people in our society and all that kind of stuff. And yes, we ought to be cutting up some of these credit cards in, in, in our society. We ought to be getting rid of some of that. We ought to begin to learn how to live on our, on, on our paycheck in our neighborhood, in our community, in our society. And we're going to have to do that. And so suffering is a discipline. Without suffering, you don't have the kind of compassion you need. So biblical suffering is not a negative. Biblical suffering is a discipline of a people. A discipline of a people. So they can have empathy. And what you can learn in suffering is saying that you can't learn no other way. Uh, man, those eight days I was in the hospital uh, three months ago was good for me. They was good for me because it helped me to reflect back on my life. And again, it helped me to uh, look forward and to number my days to recognize uh, I'm, eight, I'm seven, eight years old, and if God give me three or four or five more years, how am I going to use those years for the kingdom of God? So suffering brings a kind of insight into your life in, 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 in society. And so we need that. Uh, 
discipline, suffering of the discipline. And that's the crisis in the public schools, I guess you know that. The crisis in the American public school is that we don't have an environment of discipline. We don't know how to do that. We don't know how to do that. And that's what we got to learn how to, to do in our society. We will never be able, if those kids come from a family where you don't have fathers in the home, don't have any kind of a guidance, and it's gonna be difficult then to put any value into them because they haven't had, the Bible says the one thing that the incarnated God, when he came in the person of Jesus Christ, had to learn here on earth. There's only one thing he had to learn. The Bible said he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He learned obedient by, and so suffering here is a discipline. That's what I'm getting at. I'm not telling you to go out and cut yourself, take some, beat yourself up. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the pain that guides our life in our society. Finally, uh, this morning, then uh, the last one is faithfulness. 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 Faithfulness is the highest virtue. Vir faithfulness is what you start with. If you're going to get a leader, the leader, if, the, if you're working with somebody and they can't be on time, if you're working with somebody and they always got an excuse for and faulting somebody else for their own failure, you haven't got a person ready to be a leader. A leader has got to be found faithful first. Look out among you faithful. Faithful, that's the starting point of a leader. And don't get a novice. Don't get people who haven't been tested. So we have to be faithful. So what is faith? Faithfulness is people who live by faith, who manage their faith uh, in God. And so let me conclude then because I want to, present another person who's going to talk a little bit about public justice. I'm talking this morning about the justice of God, and I believe that public justice is a big part of God's justice here. In the, but first, let's, let's pray, and then I'm going to invite our Stanley to come up and take about five minutes, the last five or six minutes of my time. Stanley, would you come on up here um, and take some time? Uh, here, but let's pray that this word of God will have its impact on our lives. Let's pray. We're going to continue this study tomorrow, and we're going to make an application of that leadership tomorrow. Today, we looked at the justice leader, and we looked at the ingredients going to that justice leader. Tomorrow morning, we're going to make an application of that kind of leadership. When we disciple somebody, how do they act? What do they look like? And so we're going to look at Esther tomorrow morning and see how Esther acted after Mordecai had put these kind of ingredients into her. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for CCDA. Lord, we thank you for all these wonderful, wonderful people. And Lord, we thank you for helping us to get off to such a good start last night in terms of the spoken word, but also in terms of worship. It was a great evening to worship. And so we thank you for that. Now we pray that you would bless us this morning. Now bless Stanley as he shares with us something about justice and how we should be alert as we change leadership in our nation. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stanley is with the Center for Public Justice, started by a guy named Jim Skillen. I was a part of the original, original beginning of, of that organization, and we at CCDA, we don't intend to organize an organization to meet every need. We're an association of organizations, and if we have member organizations that are carrying out these duties, we want to join with those member organizations. And so the Center for Public Justice is one of those kind of organizations. Talk to us, then. Good morning. CCDA is dedicated to the kingdom of God, and God's kingdom will advance whatever the economic crisis and the political change. Amen? Amen. Nevertheless, politics and government help set the conditions for your service. And I want to talk about that just a little bit, not partisanly, 
but we are looking at a big change, and what might that mean? We don't know what's going to happen in this election. More than that, we don't know what will be the consequences of whoever's elected at the national level and the state level. But I want you to be alert because I think there may be stormy times ahead for the faith of faith-based organizations. And I want to call you to, let's call it hopeful wariness or watchful hopefulness regarding the faith-based initiative in particular in this new federal administration. I think of all the people CCDA members should want to watch to make sure that whatever happens, your ability to maintain your faith and your faith standards is not compromised. Because you serve in the name of Christ, you do Christian community development and not just what everybody else does. If the government invites you into a partnership, that partnership ought to respect your faith identity and your faith standards, right? If the government regulates you and its labor laws, its accreditation, its public accommodation laws, all those things ought to respect your faith as a Christian organization. We ought to ask for that. We ought to pray for that. You know, the last time I spoke at CCDA, along with Ron Sider, we said, back in the Clinton years, this faith-based initiative is taking off, and government has decided it has to be more friendly to the faith of faith groups. That was happening 12 years ago. And, but we said, be watchful to see what happens. Don't just say, great, you say you're going to do great things, you're going to protect us, we'll take your money, we're not going to worry about it. We said be watchful to see what the strings are that are attached to the money. Well, I think things have gotten better. Uh, it's now possible for Christian ministries to partner with government while protecting their faith standards, protecting your voluntary discipleship, protecting your ability to preach the gospel. That's wonderful. The Bush administration, though, was not as careful about all the social justice things that we care about. And that was tragic. A lot of emphasis on religious freedom, not very much, not enough on social justice. The question to me is, what will the next president and the next federal administration do? Senator John McCain has said he'll continue the Bush initiative. Does that mean good rules, but not enough public spending on essential public programs? We ought to monitor that. What's he actually going to do, whatever he says now? Senator Obama has promised a lavish, better faith-based initiative. He's promised to consult faith leaders for his public policy. I say we ought to celebrate that passion and commitment. But we ought to be wary as well as glad, watchful as well as hopeful. I think we need to be alert because there are trends that want to restrict the faith of faith groups, new pressures that want to squeeze out the faith of your ministries whether or not you take public funds. Senator Obama, for example, has publicly stated a desire to restrict your ability to hire according to Christian belief if you take public money. Is that acceptable to you? Will he do it? I think we've got to monitor that. Many members of Congress want to do exactly that. You can hear on the floor of the House of Representatives uh, your political leaders say that Christian ministries must hate people of other faith, otherwise you'd hire them. I don't think that's what you're doing with your hiring practices. You're trying to protect your Christian ministry. Brothers and sisters, there are many troubling trends out there, pressures on the faith of faith-based organizations, people who want to reverse the progress that's been made. Some of those threats come to Christian higher education, some of them come to uh, adoption agencies, some of them want to play off protecting gay people at the expense of religious freedom. I think we ought to just insist that Christian ministries, ministries of other faith, should have their rights protected. As I said, many of these threats come whether or not you partner with government, so I call on you all to be alert. Will the next president of Congress protect your freedom to operate according to Christian standards, or will they sacrifice that? Let's be watchful. Let's not be naive and taken in by words and promises and good intentions. Let's keep a kingdom perspective and monitor these public servants. You know, whatever happens, we know there's this economic storm. You're going to be called to serve your neighbors. But will you be able to do that with a full witness of the gospel, or will that witness be squeezed? I think that's what we've got to monitor. Some people want to drive a wedge between your service to the community and your commitment to Christ. 
between uh, separating Jesus from social justice, I say, let's not let that happen. Let's monitor these leaders, watch the spiritual battle. Uh, now's the time for prayer and discernment for CCDA leaders, and that's all of you. Thank you. Good morning. Aren't you glad you made the effort to wake up this morning to hear that word of God from Dr. Perkins? All right, well, for you West Coasters, it still feels like the middle of the night, so we're going to give you a three-minute break, just three minutes, and we're going to start up again with worship. Uh, but in three minutes, we will start up again.